Right, okay, welcome everybody. Um, it's great to see so many um, faces here today. It's a really well attended event. So um, we've also got lots of people online. So um, I think we should make a start without any further ado. So for um, everybody, um, welcome to the Institution of Mechanical Engineers Railway Division Southeast Centre. Um, my name's Toby Johnson, uh, and I'm uh, this year's chair of the Southeastern Centre. Um, as I said, um, it's great to see so many faces here today. Uh, we really do appreciate you coming along, uh, and I hope you enjoy tonight's event. Um, by way of um, starting off, just a quick uh, reminder that we are not expecting any fire alarms. Hope the um, uh, facilities, WCs, are back towards reception. Um, and when Andrew's presenting, if we could have phones on silent, um, that would be great. Um, I'm just going to do a couple of um, announcements. So um, our next event is on the 17th of April, um, and it's called Central Line Improvement. Uh, we'll have Ed Hurd and Scott Butcher from uh, Transport for London, who will be talking about these uh, improvements to the Central Line uh, 92 tube stock. Uh, we'll have a short AGM before that. Um, so uh, we can now, uh, I just want to say that if you would like to nominate um, for um, membership to the centre, then you can do this um, now if you'd like to be part of the uh, centre committee. Um, you can email, get in touch with me via uh, my email address, which is on the near, I'm a key near you website. Um, so that's also on the 17th of April at RSSB. Um, another quick plug for um, an event which um, the IMAC is running. It's called Adapting Railways for a Sustainable Future, Rebalancing, Resilience and Realisation. Um, that's an all day seminar on the 30th of April at um, IMACI headquarters on Birdcage Walk. OK. So that's introductions uh, um, done from me. What I would like to do is to get to our main presenter, uh, which we're all here to really hear from, and that's Andrew Dunsby. He's um, senior rolling stock engineer, um, and uh, he's going to talk to us today about the new trains for the Docklands Light Railway. So, Andrew, over to you. Thanks very much. So, I've come to talk to you about the new train for Docklands on the DLR Docklands Light Railway. Um, one of the first, uh, one of the first comments I had uh, was about changing the picture <laughs> to make sure it's more suitable for screen. It's not updating. Anyway, for some reason. Am I sharing? It's come up. Uh, so I've been on the project since after contract award and have been involved uh, through the preliminary and then detailed designs, uh, moving into testing, manufacturing, and then testing uh, of, of the trains. So I'll give a brief history of uh, the DLR, um, why we need new trains, a uh, bit about the design development, uh, the manufacturing, uh, testing both in Spain and here in the UK, uh, a few of the challenges we've come across, uh, and then sort of what's next and where we're do what what we've still got to do and where we're heading. Um, we have given previous presentations, so. Uh, I hope you may have seen some of these slides previously on the brief history, but we've shortened it down. So, so the evolution of the DLR. Updating. <laughs> um, so evolution of the DLR uh, started and opened in 1987. Uh, the service started with single P86 car operation. Uh, on the, the red section that you can see on the screen, uh, that was rapidly 
extended to bank, at which point the B90s and the B92s came into operation with their end door for fire requirements. Uh, the Beckton extension and depot uh, at Beckton uh, happened in 94. The Lewisham extension was down, done in 99. And the city airport expansion uh, in 2005, followed by Woolwich Arsenal in 2009. The B2007s were delivered in 2009 and were increased in number a number of times. Uh, and currently the BLR operates a mixture of two and three car service. Uh, the Stratford International Extension was done for the 2012 Olympics and passenger journeys are currently around 120 million a year. So the existing trains, uh, B92s on the left, uh, currently we have 94 of them, which is equivalent to 31 of the new trains going on the way the cars work. Uh, so these will be phased out and removed from service as the new trains are delivered. The remaining 55 B2007s, which is equivalent to 18 of new trains, uh, with remaining two car consist, um, will remain in service alongside the new B23s, as they were called. Uh, B92s and B2007s aren't electrically compatible, so they don't couple for service operation. The new trains will mechanically couple with the both the old types uh, for service introduction and rescue, but not for operation. Uh, and the PSAs will obviously have to transfer between initially three different stocks and eventually two different stocks. Uh, so we've tried to make the functionality and operational differences as minimal as possible to allow for easy cross transfer. Uh, so all the PSA keys and locks uh, will remain the same for interoperation. So why do we need new trains? Uh, we are looking for growth, so we are actually getting 10 new additional trains uh, to support growth in the Royal Docks, uh, expansion at City Airport. Uh, housing infrastructure funding has also approved further 11 trains. Uh, the life of the existing fleet is coming to an end, design life around about now, uh, with a number of sort of long term design life issues beginning to show and they're coming up to their next heavy overhaul. Um, and then the other reason is to make full use of existing infrastructure. So we, with the new trains, we'll be able to operate a full three car consist effectively across the entire network. So capacity has been used. Passenger numbers have nearly doubled since the last B2007 update uh, and has pretty much stabilised at Olympic levels. Uh, and there's still lots of development going on in East London uh, where the DLR is the main and often only practical means of public transport with key developments around the Albert Business Park and Galleons Reach DLR. So. This was the growth that was put forward when the contract was sort of let and the project was going ahead. So the current franchise ended, or should well, ended in 2021 and was extended uh, to April 2025 with Keolis Amy Docklands, and they're currently tendering the new franchise with uh, up to three preferred bids at the moment. So it's not necessarily a good time to refranchise from a program or project point of view. Adds quite a lot of extra workload <laughs> on the program to deliver the amount of information needed. Uh, and obviously it will have challenges as we introduce trains across the franchise. So we look forward to that. DLR growth, so this is what's actually happened. Unsurprisingly, there was a dip around 21, 
uh, but numbers are recovering. I don't have last year's, but it's certainly heading back towards where we were. Maybe a few more, a bit more specific on days, since most of us come in on fewer days, but it's certainly increasing. So what did the TFL sponsor want? Uh, we asked for 43 fixed formation uh, walkthrough trains to replace the B92 fleet. And this increases the fleet overall size by 20%, um, exceeds 90% uh, availability and 99% reliability. Uh, fully accessible with a design life of 35 years this time. The B92s were only for nine, uh, 25 years as a light rail view. Minimum capacity of 792 passengers per train. So that goes up from 660 on the existing three car contest. Uh, GOA3 operation with the option for GOA4 in the future. Uh, performance to match the B2007s with the option to increase the performance of the 07s in the future to, to match the new fleet. At this point in time, it's debatable whether that will actually ever happen. We'll see. Um, new trains, uh, CCTV throughout, uh, real time transmission of low way by carriaging, carriages, air conditioning, uh, mobile charging, and Wi Fi. So, CAF won the tender with the following offer and proposed external design. So you may have seen images of this around previously. Uh, they tended for a, a five car carriage train, 86.7 meters long with walk through articulations, consisting of three motor cars and two trailer cars, uh, 12 doors per side, three sets of doors on the accessible cars, all doors, twin biparting, sensitive edge, maximum speed of 80 kph, uh, an acceleration of 1.3 up to 30 kph, uh, up to and including full load mass. Uh, full load capacity, said before, was 792, uh, with 157 seats, 142 fixed, and 15 tip ups, uh, and air conditioning roof mounted. So we quickly changed the design of the train. <laughs> <laughs> to be what you actually see. Uh, this went through a number of design iterations, obviously, uh, with our design, sort of TFL's internal design team, uh, and the, the, the livery was uh, selected from uh, corporate selection of colours <laughs> that TFL allows. Uh, so, yeah. Underneath, uh, we have six motor bogies, two motors per bogey, uh, three dual traction converters, uh, one per motor car, giving individual control per bogey. Uh, two auxiliary, sorry, two compressors with air dryers, uh, two auxiliary converters, uh, and mechanical couplers uh, for existing coupling with either the B23s for rescue or the existing fleet. Uh, the, the new trains don't electrically couple either. Uh, so the trains will have analog fixed train radio, uh, Wi-Fi, LTE, networks for remote condition monitoring with real-time monitoring of faults and degraded operation for doors, uh, CIS, customer information system, passenger occupancy monitoring, uh, and I'll come in a, minute, uh, a high definition digital CCTV, system to record and display color color video images from cameras located throughout the train included including forward cameras at both ends uh, pa and pea functions uh, and DRAM wide gang weights so we held a number of design workshops with caf uh, we were lucky enough to do these in person uh, they certainly helped integrate our teams and created a very good working relationship between CAF, ourselves, and also CAD, who came along the, uh, reps to, to support design workshops. So we 
developed and improved uh, the driving emergency driving positions and the door control positions, so the EDP and the DCPs. So CAF, we originally started with wooden mock-ups uh, and then expanded to use 3D virtual reality headsets uh, to understand the design ideas, the views looking in and out of the train. Um, we Human factors were also involved. Uh, you can see the change in button layouts from the new old to the new. Uh, the new is a lot clearer. We obviously have the ability option to have the screens. So a lot of TCMS is through touchscreen functionality. Screen on the right is the TOD train operator display for the signal information from PC. So other changes made. So we changed the button layout uh, to be easier to operate. So door control is now closer to the, the person standing as is ATO start and the controls used less frequently further away. Uh, we also changed the height of the ED. So under manual operation or when the PSA has to stand at the front of the train to operate it, it's now in a more suitable range for the 5th and 95th percentile to stand at the front. Um, we have also introduced a new mode, uh, slightly oxymoron of ATO manual. Um, maybe better called ATO attended. Basically, it forces the PSA to be at the front of the train uh, to operate the traction brake controller as a dead man switch. So that it forces a sort of safe operation if you either have concerns of people trackside or known people trackside for, for workers. So, so we've sort of moved to sort of safety critical modes of operation are standing and sort of non-safety critical modes could be seated. Again, that's why the door buttons are close to the edge. So if you're seated, you can still reach them for sort of ATO local command and prop. Door control panel on the left there, or DCP, um, still has the same indications at the top. Uh, we've added a new uh, a new screen for dwell time. Uh, which obviously helps the PSA know how long they've got left platform to help them with their platform duties. And one of the main things we've done is we've moved the operator's key uh, to the bottom of the DCP to help with uh, human factors. Uh, and we've also alternated the door DCPs on each side of the doors so that they don't always have to use the same arm or hand to operate the switches. So it increases flexibility. Um, the auxiliary panel on the right, since it's a five car consist, PSA walked through the train. These are at the ends of the B and D cars, so about two thirds of the way through the train. It allows them additional information or access to train information uh, with a TCMS panel. See on the screen, it's already it's showing uh, I think Dave <laughs> on the CCDV, um, but it allows them to to travel, not have to walk to the end of the train every time they want to see what TCMS is showing or an alarm. It also includes a handset for the PA um, or to respond to PEAs, uh, train radio controls, and then ops on, ops off, and train secure. Um, you can also see at the bottom uh, the USB sockets that are fitted uh, through the train. So detailed design, uh, we obviously had a few challenges with the pandemic, um, working from home, um, CAF continued to work as did ourselves, working from home throughout, um, everyone learning how to work remotely before technology caught up with us, really. Um, the remainder of RSRP being mainly building works was put on hold. So uh, uh, we'll come back to that later. Uh, TFL policy was to not travel, even when travel was allowed. Uh, so again, it made life harder. Um, a lot of our workshops became virtual. Um, acceptance of the mock-up mock before it was sent to the UK 
was done via a Zoom and a YouTube live stream, which had an unfortunate delay in it. So you'd ask them to show you something, and then about two minutes later, the camera would move to that location. So you sort of had to preempt what you were asking and what you had asked two minutes ago to, to actually try and work out what you were seeing. Um, in the end, I think we it worked out quite well, and we were actually pleased with the mock-up when we when it arrived in the UK. Um, first article inspections were done via Zoom or Teams. I think only one was done in the UK, uh, and that was with Percy Lane because they're based in the UK. <laughs> so, um, so there were benefits. I mean, so obviously it's a a missed opportunity to look and touch close up, and that is something we're still missing, have missed out on for some of the systems to this day. Um, but in other ways, you can get more people to attend. Because obviously, if people are just sitting at their desks, you can have any number of people attending them, as opposed to trying to send everyone to Spain or other countries would actually have been quite a challenge. So in some ways, it, there are benefits, but I think in general, not having sent some is, is a loss. Um, we had to employ a Spanish based resource to, our, to act as our quality inspectors, uh, and they're continuing to do that job uh, now. Uh, and we mi missed out on witnessing a sort of type testing for the first train set as well, for the same reasons. So, some of our key sub suppliers traction and bogies and tcms all come from caf uh, the top bbc from talus uh, air brakes air and brakes from nor brems doors from kanji china cctv pa and eis or cis from Teleste, down a couplers modem from icomera Hasler for the OTMR onboard train monitoring recorder or maintenance recorder, HVAC ISPA code, the asset automatic infrastructure monitoring system uh, is OBB. As I said before, well, the end door was Bursley Lane, so that was the only one we actually got to see in person for seeing the train. So, so this is uh, a Computer generated image. Actually, no, it's not battery. I thought, anyway, the computer generated images we got were very realistic and re really helped with the design. So, the project has introduced a new DLR maquette, um, which was designed in house in TFL. And we've also got a new priority seat maquette uh, with sort of the, the TFL standard sort of priority seat. Uh, blue logo on the back. Um, we have specific areas, uh, three of them for wheelchair users. Uh, they don't have tip up seats or perch seats. So, to try and prevent people from using them that uh, shouldn't, or, uh, plus companion seating. Uh, with, and this was actually an addition following the mock up when some of our user groups visited. Um, and we added that as a priority seat to, and become a companion seat. Uh, so this is uh, the real train. So the backrest of the wheelchair is is quite a challenging design to, to actually make it what everyone wants, because everyone seems to have a different view as to what a wheelchair backrest should be. Um, and the Arvar, standard only effectively caters for what's called a standard wheelchair of a specific size and dimension. Obviously, wheelchairs and mobility scooters come in all flavours. So trying to come up with a single design that covers a majority of them is actually quite challenging. This was CAF's best. It's sort of similar to uh, one of the ones on the buses. It's a bit wider. so. It, the idea is it allows you to put your backrest or put your wheels against frame. So traction converter, two inverters per converter, 
therefore traction control is per bogey, uh, contains the three phase converters, uh, IGBTs, uh, input filters, filter inductors, uh, common mode filters, current and voltage sensors, uh, the brake chopper, uh, discharge resistors to discharge the capacitors uh, and the cooling system. The bogey motor, this is a motor bogey. So the bogey bolster has an internal air, is an air, internal air tank for the suspension system to, to save weight, uh, save having another tank. Uh, we've got two motors, gearboxes, flexible couplings. Uh, the motors are three phase asynchronous, open self ventilated induction type with a squirrel cage rotor, uh, supporting acceleration of up to 1.3 up to 30 kph, uh, disc brakes, air suspension, and as you can see, resilient wheels. Current fleets have resilient wheels as, and disc brakes, so it's not new for the DLR. Uh, and shoe gear, which is under contact, same consistent <laughs> uh, Trailing bogies, I don't have a picture of one, sorry, uh, have the TBTC antennas and tacos. Uh, obviously, they don't have shoe gear or motors, but they do include brakes and they have a non-service brake axle for the VOPC. Automatic infrastructure monitoring system, or AIMS. Uh, we have two of these fitted to two trains. Uh, they collect wayside data for our track colleagues. Uh, the difference and benefit to DLR and CAD for this is that the measurements taken will be under load. Um, when they use their track trolley, the, the trolley isn't heavy enough, heavy enough to simulate load. So it's that, it makes validating this quite difficult because the, the data that you get from it could actually be different from the track trolley. And one of those differences could be the weight of the track. So, but it's, it is beneficial to, to have loaded measurements. So our track colleagues are itching to get data. Uh, one of the challenges has been to set up the monitoring, or sorry, one of the challenges for DLR will be to set up the monitoring system and the routing of trains. Obviously, if you've got two trains, they will want to cover the entire network, so they will have to work out how they route the trains and whether they, at the start of service, the B23s will probably only work on certain routes. So if they want to use, collect data on other routes, they may have to run night test trains to initially collect data. So we'll have to see how they go with that. Um, the other question is, who is going to look at the data? I don't think they've decided whether it's DLR or CAD, uh, their franchisee or whoever the new franchisee is. And provision of analysis software. Uh, the software extracts into uh, an OBB format or could be converted into CSV, but obviously that creates large amounts of data to, to be reviewed. Um, Obviously, OBB provides software, but it's up to, it's not provided by CAF. CAF are only providing the brain born equipment. So if DLR need, want software, they need to purchase it. So, Talus onboard products for the vehicle onboard controller or top VOBC. Uh, so this is the latest uh, flavor of VOBCs from Talus. This was primarily built for CBTC with radio-based transmissions. So early in the project, our signaling colleagues worked with Talus to create a new module that works with the radio-based, the loop-based comms. Uh, so this is a modern DOBC, but with the loop-based comms to work with the DLR network. It also has a uh, dual accelerometer accelerometers. Uh, you can actually see a difference in the pictures. Uh, the one on the left has got two separate and the one on the right, for some reason, they, they redesigned it to be two together. That's why. I don't actually know. <laughs> but anyway, uh, and we we had to work quite hard with CAF and then with TALUS to get them to design a bracket that goes over the top of them to prevent the accelerometers being fitted the wrong way around. Um, Apparently, the design had to be approved by Talus, even though it doesn't 
interact with <laughs> their, their accelerometers because uh, it just fits over the top anyway. So that was an unexpected challenge. Uh, so we, as I said before, we have two non-service braked axles for the TBTC for the VOBCs, the tacos, two, one on each B and D car, but one for each VOBC. We have two VOBCs on board the frame. Um, so obviously the latest design removes obsolescence, uh, which the VOBC, existing VOBCs might have. And since we've already done the mod for the loop-based comms, this might pave the way for retrofitting of LU fleets, uh, Jubilee and Northern Line, if they ever want to go down that route. One challenge that has come up, the VABC, the new VABC is now software driven, much like your laptop is, as opposed to sort of machine code driven, which the original ones are. So when you reboot it, it now takes three and between three and four minutes, whereas the other ones pretty much booted instantaneously. So that will give our operational colleagues uh, a challenge so that when they reset it, they will have to unfortunately wait longer. There isn't much we can do about it because it's the design, design ethos of the VOBC. Um, it is something they're going to have to factor in when they need to reset it. Hopefully they won't need to. Uh, so gangways, uh, we have quite a long gangway, about one and a half meters. Um, this is to support the, the standard of standard boat car bodies with two bogies that gives quite a bit of end throw uh, to cope with the dynamic track conditions and curve radii and reverse curves. The DLR has 40 meter reverse curves. So the FAI, again done remotely, uh, was done with a moving rig to check all of the the actual dynamic movements were possible. Uh, the, the gangway has also, the manufacturer has created, man, made gangways this length before or for other fleets, so had confidence that it's possible. Um, I'll talk about some of the testing we've done with it later. The new trains come with uh, a passive obstacle detector, the bar you can see running across. So this is in addition to the sort of the lifeguards that are fitted. Um, the project did originally want uh, an active de detection uh, using cameras, but at the time functionality wasn't really available for GOA3 operation. It was more suited for people with trains with cabs uh, as an alert or a warning for the driver. So we, we moved away from that quite early on. Uh, and on the left, you can also see uh, that's the filler tank for the flange lubrication system. And on the right, you can see the, the actual nozzle uh, for the flange lubrication system. The system is air driven to send pulses of lubricant onto the bogies, onto the flanges. Uh, the train has a database of trigger points and it uses the VOBC location data to locate the train on the database and apply the loop. And, um, one of the challenges is to introduce it for both testing in, and in service. Uh, we've got a rollout strategy with hold points to, to make sure we can test it properly to make sure it interfaces correct existing system, which is stick loot. The CAF sort of off board or wayside system for monitoring uh, both faults, events, and operational information is called LeadMind. Um, and it allows engineering to get alarms and alerts in real time from the train uh, when it's above ground or it's got a phone signal. Uh, hopefully, they'll put mobile comms in Bank and Woolwich Arsenal Tunnel soon. Uh, and it allows a graphical interface for alarms. Uh, users can, speci can create specific algorithms to log specific events and to help diagnose faults. Uh, and it can be used to control limited set of train functions, um, HVAC, uh, stabling mode, uh, and ox on or ox off the train if the train's in the right mode. Uh, 
Uh, and then it also has an operational front for uh, the people in the control center to ha have a fleet view of the trains. Uh, one thing we, we've learned, it, we don't seem to be able to, as soon as the train goes live, it goes onto the system, which means trains in Spain that are connected to LeadMind will also show up on the operator's control panel in, in Beckton. Um, they may be horrified at the number of faults <laughs> that some of the trains may have. So we, we haven't crossed that bridge yet, but <laughs> uh, it's something we're going to have to address at some point and work out how we do it. We also have an operator's mobile communication device, acronym I can never remember, OMCD. This is effectively a, a large phone that, with, that uses the internal Wi-Fi of the train to connect to the TCMS. Um, it allows the PSA to carry it through the train with them. Uh, they can make and respond, make PA call to respond to PA, and they can see the TCMS alarms. So again, means they don't PSAs are mobile, so it allows them to be be more mobile and do their job as they're meant to. But so some of the other features: fire and smoke detection. Uh, we've got detectors in the saloon for fire and smoke, uh, traction equipment have linear heat detectors, uh, CCTV I've said before a forward facing or a saloon and the CCTV can be in, reviewed in real time or downloaded in the control center to events. Uh, customer information system real time including uh, failure information of the TFL rainbow board uh, and digital advertising uh, presses and air dryers and derailment detectors. That's what the picture is on the right hand side. We've got two fitted to each car. These obviously don't prevent derailment, but they do apply the emergency brake in the event derailment is detected to help limit damage. Mock up. So we did eventually get the mock up sent to the UK. Um, it was located at Ilford in the Tunnelling Underground Construction Academy. It was delivered back in 2020. Still had restrictions, so there were no official press events, but we did get uh, disability and awareness groups to, to see the train. I will admit CAF did a very good job. Obviously, the mock-up is a an amalgamation of different parts of the train in one mock-up, so you won't find one car exactly like this. The quality of it was such that it, it's given us a very good view of, of the train design. And it was very similar to sort of the computer generated images we had before. So it, it did all add up. Um, changes made following the mock up. Um, we, we added double armrests to the priority seating, um, changed the external door release mechanism to be, become flush. Sorry, you can't see that there. Uh, and the PA, PEA for the disabled access uh, was modified to make it easier to operate. Uh, by the way, sorry, I've not talked about doors much. Uh, the doors have sensitive edge, they're a micro plug. So they do actually pull in slightly at the end to prove sealing and heat retention. Uh, they have sensitive edge and obstacle detection, uh, and we're actually in the process of fitting a second sensitive edge, uh, partly due to changing requirements after the design is put through. So, uh, lesson learned: think about where you want the mock-up to go before you have it delivered or built. This is a single item, <laughs> and at the time, we didn't have anywhere to put it. <laughs> Very similar to our simulator, actually. So, if you want it to fit through a normal door, <laughs> tell them. Uh, manufacturing. So, again, you can see these are screenshots from Zoom meetings because we weren't allowed on site. So, the car bodies are manufactured in CAF's, one of CAF's main plants in Versailles. Uh, they're painted, then moved to the production line for fit out uh, and completed cars roll off. Uh, quality checks at various points. Uh, we have a, a a plan of works with SGS uh, to, who do the checks on our behalf, and we have regular meetings with them. 
first article inspections generally completed at the practice site and then obviously factory testing uh, static uh, include type testing and routine testing so type testing is for the approval of design and then routine testing is ensuring build uh, so type testing these are all done on the first train uh, static testing done initially obviously at Bayer sign the uh, train was the five cars were moved and coupled up into the testing bay at the Bayer sign factory uh, and again it proves basic design I won't run through the list uh, and going on uh, I will say evacuation obviously we weren't able to witness it in real time but we did get some very exciting videos from CAF of the same people walking around in a big circle as they evacuated the train uh, so yes it makes life a bit quicker if you can speed <laughs> speed through the video um, so the train then get, gets moved to Korea which is about two hours south of Bear Sign uh, for dynamic type testing uh, that included traction testing sort of acceleration brake curves uh, the VOVC got through it, put through its paces with dynamic picos post-installation checkouts uh, CAF modified the test track to fit the talus loop uh, loop cables and the DVTD support testing one challenge was talus only signed the test track off at 20 kph despite it being a five kilometer long test track so it didn't get used as much as perhaps we had hoped it would um, so I'll come on to that in a bit later but uh, obviously brake testing emergency service and wheel slide protection with uh, soap water um, EMC testing driving past a few antennas different types um, noise testing energy consumption Energy consumption is an interesting one because it's all about the setup of the parameters and the scenarios that you want it to run as to how you want it to to actually validate it. So energy consumption is something that's gone right through the contract. So they had to design their en energy consumption as, and put it in their bid. So it's quite an important part of the CAF design because it's one of the requirements of the contract. So when you do it, you have to think about when you write the contract, how are we actually going to test it to actually validate the energy consumption? So we went back and forward on that a few times. Staff did a good job uh, and the train came out more energy efficient originally planned and running resistance. Uh, so we obviously do quite a few quality checks. Uh, Quality checks in the factory, witnessing testing. We develop what's called a glass case document. It basically lists all of the different areas of the train and the level of quality that we expect for, for each. Uh, we uh, obviously have contractual hold points, acceptance checks. One of the challenges we've had is around tolerances, so how much something is able to change. Uh, before it becomes not allowed on allowed is one of the challenges we've had. Uh, so quality checks include uh, doing the bogey both on the bogey frame and obviously complete bogey. So after testing, we move into a fault free running which is still on the test track. So the, as I said, the original aim for fault free running was to be completed in ATO mode because of the speed limitation. Trying to do 20,000 kilometers at 20 kph becomes a little <laughs> long winded. So, we agreed to effectively modify emergency shunt to remove the 20 kph speed limit and allow to operate at 80 kph on their test track, uh, which worked successfully. It just means we haven't done as much reliability proving on the VABC as we'd have liked. Uh, so the reliability targets you can see there obviously the first trains increase in mileage uh, as they go up and as they go down get further on the mileage goes down uh, and the mdbttsaf is mean distance between test track service affecting failures because obviously the test track is a unique environment not completely 
realistic, but anyway. One of the challenges, the train's not been tested in the build seat. So for various reasons, uh, CAF have taken trains out, put them in storage, and then bring trains later through. So where you think of trains one and two being the first two trains, actually it was trains one and three. Trains three to five was another batch off the production line, not necessarily trains three, four, and five off the build line. So that makes life a little harder when you plan quality inspections, thinking you're going to witness the development of the build program when actually the 10th train you go to see is the 27th off the build line. It, it makes uh, life a little challenging. Uh, we also got the simulator used for training the PSAs, passenger service assistance. It includes full DLR network and routes, all modes of operation. Uh, uniquely, it, you can train from both the front of the train, the EDP, and the DCP. So it, it allows dual operation of training. It's got various scenarios and failures to for fault recognition, rectification. But delivery of the first, this isn't the first train, delivery of the train to Beckton, this is the third train to Beckton to Alum. Uh, so obviously five cars came on the back of five lorries driven from Spain. Uh, that messed up our carbon modelling because we thought they were going to put them on ships. Um, cars unloaded by the original depot delivery road and moved into the main shed. Uh, so we had to get assurance for a shunting turtle which was a bit more of a challenge than we expected. And we used an existing vehicle as a shunting vehicle uh, to move them around the depth to the shed. Uh, trains then get, cars get coupled together and then statically tested train. Uh, we had a phased sequence of testing or have a phase sequence. Phase one is limited to emergency shunt. Um, we did a uh, Gauging, although we didn't actually in the end carry out much gauging, the CAF assessments and modelling for gauging highlighted some specific areas of concern from the laser modelling that, that was done. Um, so although we had planned to take the train to those locations, our track colleagues beat us to it, checked that their wayside assets were where they were meant to be rather than us having to check the train. So that saved us some gauging. Um, we also did uh, rescue tests, push out tests. Um, the last thing you want is your train to break down and not be able to move it. So that was done. Uh, phase two is with ATP. So phase 2A was sort of the validation of the VOBC. So we hadn't got a test track in the depot. So we did uh, dynamic decos on the main line. So that's what phase 2A is. And then 2B effectively ATO operation up to line speed. Testing in both closures and weak engineering hours. And we had a bit of an interesting discussion at the start. Do you do gauging or signaling testing first? We 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 won with uh, gauging. So we we went out slow speed and did our gauging and PTI checks first. Uh, and then we followed it on with signaling. Uh, Coupler, so this is coupling, this is in the depot, but shows the, the range of movements the coupler has to go through uh, on a reverse curve in the depot. Uh, and right, one is the train out testing at the ends. So again, got various pictures across the network. Sorry, I'm aware of the time. Uh, PTI checks. Uh, we carried out quite a few checks at Canary Wharf and other locations of known uh, known platforms with specific ETI concerns. There are about 10 platforms. Uh, we also did quite a bit of testing with mirrors and monitors. Um, the latest crash worthiness standards means the view from the front of the train is different to the existing train. So we have got different visibility. So they have gone round and effectively stop the train short at the right position and then long it, all of the platforms to check whether you can actually see the mir in the mirrors and monitors that are what you can actually see and make sure it's visible. 
one of the challenges is not all of them are suitable for the new design of the train. So we are, as a programme, going around and replacing some of the existing mirrors with new monitors. But that's an extra bit of work to do. And we did have done some ride quality with the gangways across some of the reverse curves. Um, we confused our line controllers by asking for really weird routes to get the train to go across all of the worst case, even though you wouldn't normally do it in service. Um, and that meant a couple of reverse reruns as they didn't believe what we were asking for. Um, so, so worst case with the long gangways is, is the dynamic movement across them. And the output might be that we reduce the speed of crossovers to, to enable people to, to stand in them. The routes in question are generally not used for passenger service, just in case. So I've pretty much covered that. Um, so phase 2B, um, automatic speed control, VOBC testing, they were done mainly in closures. The ability of the VOBC to control the train, start, stop, stop accurately. Uh, traction performance, radio checks, customer information, aims, so on. Uh, more of the same. You can see the old weights come out for loaded train testing. We've obviously done, started to do CIS testing. Um, the new screens uh, are digital and include a route map of uh, the network. Again, partly because of the pandemic, we did actually get one of the screens shipped to the UK in our office in Poplar. And we did quite a lot of design work to, with, and it made it a lot easier to get more people to actually see the screens in real life at Poplar to, to validate the design. So hopefully what, what's seen is expected. The, the challenge is just to make it work properly. So, so assurance process. So before the trains are shipped to the UK, we have pre-provisional acceptance. Uh, we have provisional acceptance, which is another quality check prior to trains going into passenger service. Final acceptance of each individual train once it's achieved its reliability targets. And then a final fleet acceptance for the fleet to reach 50,000. Um, and there's the list of assurance gates uh, that we have to present to DLR change assurance panel. Challenges. Uh, we've talked about the pandemic, but one of the things it did was because they delayed the rest of the program, means we're still delivering the trains without the new depot, new sidings in place. So we've had to do additional mods, had to modify existing roads in the new existing shed with the power supply to power the trains to allow us to deliver and test. Uh, we had an unexpected failure mode in that the power supply wasn't suitable for new trains, which means we can't run the HVAC. Yeah. So we've got trains in the UK with HVAC not been run for a year, which isn't the best thing. Um, we also have a lack of stabling roads. So it, it, it is a one in, one out process almost. We have to get rid of a train if we want another one in, um, or we out stable. I'm not quite sure how many platforms Brandon. We'll find out. Um, HMI is always a challenge uh, and sequencing of alarms on the TCMS to make sure that the information presented to the PSA is uh, A, usable and doesn't bombard them with information and tells them the same thing and tells them the most important thing. Um, we, we're still working with CAF on that. Uh, changing standards. TTS was now written over five years ago, but there is a general expectation because it's a brand new train, it's going to comply with all of the latest standards. It won't necessarily. <laughs> Cybersecurity is one interesting one, because obviously it's the technology that moves rapidly on um, that we don't keep up with it, basically. Uh, stabling mode temperatures, this is an interesting one. The train has a stabling mode to reduce HVAC, so air cons power consumption in the depot. But one of the things that you don't think about is when you come to turn the HVAC back on in the morning, you risk increasing the power load across the entire depot. 
because all of the trains may be turned on in a relatively short space. So the actual maximum power requirement goes up quite a lot because all of the trains will probably go into maximum current draw to heat uh, whilst they're stable. That's that's actually caused a problem for our power colleagues because it means they need to put bigger cables in to, to cope with the, the maximum loads. Uh, and then configuration control is a challenge and will continue to be a challenge as we will have trains in multiple locations and at some point we'll have trains in service, trains in the factory and testing. So actually trying to do modifications on them will become more challenging than it already is. Uh, maintenance and reliability, uh, contractual requirement greater than 40,000 kilometres, uh, exam periodicity of 30,000, and I'm not quite sure what's gone wrong with my fonts, but never mind. Uh, train designed for maximum two hour repair time. Uh, we're also getting an ATSS, which is fitted in Beckton to monitor the underside of the train to help monitor shoe gear wear, brake wear, to, to, to collect data preemptively and preventively. Uh, we're also increasing the size of the depot. Uh, the existing depot was built mainly for the existing trains, a single car consist, not for a five car train. So we're getting new southern sidings, new northern sidings, and a new shed. New shed, which will include four roads, a uh, dedicated lifting road, a mo. I don't think we're getting a mobile wheel lathe now. Sorry, my notes are out of <laughs> my notes are old. Uh, a high level access for the HVAC and aircon maintenance and swimming pool pit roads. Uh, additional works that are also going on in the program power upgrades across the network and earth returns. There is a monitor I've talked about already. Uh, line side comms obviously, the train needs to communicate with something, and at the moment, that something is still in progress. Uh, new fire exit at Blackwall due to the increase in passenger numbers. I've already mentioned the ATSS and signaling upgrades. So the VCCs are being updated to support trains. What happens next? We currently have uh, well, two trains are currently being tested, uh, have been tested for the last year. Uh, the third train was delivered the end of last year, is almost ready to start testing. Uh, we've got remaining mainline tests and signaling testing to be completed. Then we move into reliability proving, and then we go into the fun of assurance for passenger service, handover of assets to DLR, and then to CAD, which will be another interesting and transfer of maintenance. And that's it. Uh, I'd like to thank CAF and various people for the use of their photos, uh, and also thanks to the Rolling Stock team, Dave, Andy, Barbara, and Stuart for your comments. Any question? Sorry, I realise I probably sped up through that as I realised my time was running out, so apologies. <laughs> So effectively, the, the train has been designed to fit the structures and the gauging requirements uh, rather than modify modify the infrastructure. So, so no, we've not had to do anything for the infrastructure specifically that I'm aware of unless, sorry, looking at Andy or Dave, <laughs> I, I don't think we have. Yeah, so. And yeah, we I think a few things got moved from a gauging or 
noise point of view, but I think they were planned to be moved anyway. So not specifically. Great, thank you. Um, question at the back then. We're not looking at it directly. It's something that the train had to be capable of in the future. Um, so it, in, it includes the ability, let's say, of the VBC to close the doors. But beyond that, uh, there isn't that much to be done. As you say, there's a lot more wayside infrastructure. The other challenge the DLR has got is is a uh, mixed fleet. So until they do, we think of something to do with the existing B2007s or get rid of them, it, it's it's a little way off in the future. So obviously the VOBC would need to be updated at the same time to, to support GOA4 operation. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I'm just going to take a um, couple from, from in the chat. There was a couple um, about the obstacle deflection. Um, so the, um, there was a question about whether you'd had left any passive position to be able to fit um, automatic obstacle deflection in the future. Uh, and the other question was, what sort of obstacles has the current system been designed for? So yes, we have left passive provision for uh, equipment to be fitted. Uh, we still have the forward facing camera. So uh, provision is still there. And we still have the signals into the VABC if that's required. Uh, so yes, passive provision. Uh, in terms of what the obstacle detection is designed for, I will admit I'm not <laughs> off the top of my head. I'm not entirely sure. Um, it it obviously is above the height of a lifeguard, but yes, in terms of what it's been designed for, I, I can't remember off the top. Chopping trolley, but it's got to be low enough to go under the front of the train. As Okay, so the, the question was, <laughs> and due to the pandemic, um, is the is the project uh, running late? And as a result, have there been any life extension works on the uh, existing fleets? So we have done our best to keep to the original program um, from a rolling stock point of view, uh, and that has led us to having to do additional works or modifications in the depot to try and overcome some of the other delays. I um, believe the project is running a little late at the moment for other reasons, not specifically linked to the pandemic. Um, it didn't help also that one of our contractors in the depot uh, went bust, uh, so it caused extra delays for, for the new depot. Um, 
Sorry, I forgot to ask. So the B-92s are coming up to a, a, a heavy overhaul in their next main overhaul. And at the moment, that has been a certain number of trains have been planned around the original time scale, time scales. And at the moment, I'm not aware that they are being extended because it's obviously quite a in-depth process to start a heavy overhaul stop. So we will probably, as a DLR, will have some challenge of keeping existing fleets run. Thank you. Um, OK, another what, question perhaps from the room. Uh, hand at the back went up first. OK, so the question was uh, that the uh, tyre profile has been um, developed uh, during the first introduction to cope with the geometry of the DLR and how you cope with that. This project. So we've basically mandated the same profile as on the existing fleets as on the new trains. So, so the actual wheel profiles it, it are the same. So that would so, save so any compatibility issues. We'll see how how hunting goes, because obviously a feature of the, D the DLR is is hunting because of the wheel profile. Um, we'll, we'll have to see as the new fleets are introduced and a different profile of, wheel, of di different type of train, different axle and load uh, changes any hunting profiles of the train. Yeah. We won't know until all of the new trains are in and all of the old trains are out. Good. Um, I'm going to ask a question that's a bit coming on the chat. Um, so you, you mentioned about cyber security um, during your presentation. The, um, Stephen online asked whether you've had any, uh, did you find any cyber security issues with the provision of the USB charging uh, points on the train? So the USB charging points are only connected for power. There's no actual uh, connection to the to the train uh, data system. So from that point of view, uh, no, we're, we're okay from a. It, they literally just charge. Um, we've had some challenges because the train has the ability. The wayside had the ability to send commands to the train. So it's not just the train sending data as a passive device it has the ability to actually receive mark so that is where our cyber colleagues are more concerned at them than necessarily just send track day yeah thank you um any more questions from the room okay uh oh gone in ian's had his, his hand up <laughs> twice so i'm going to go to ian for this question And thanks. So the the, uh, the question was around um, with applying load cases to the vehicle um, from the from a structural point of view, um, given that Cafford's had some other issues on on other stocks. And did you have uh, confidence in the CAF understands what the load cases are for this vehicle? Uh, so so yes, you're correct. Um, whenever we get uh, information from other fleets, we have fed back to CAF to make sure. Uh, we understand if it affects uh, B23 design or, or not. Um, we also have uh, an independent safety assessor and independent assessor to, to ensure the train is designed against standards um, independently to CAF. Um, in terms of the T-slots, uh, we don't have any sort of dynamic loads off T-slots. Um, so issues that have occurred won't occur on ours because we don't have that design to start. But good to know. 
Oh yeah, no, it's. it's um, yeah, there was another question at uh, the back. OK, so that was a question about the um, the onboard uh, mobile device that the P PAS has and whether it um, has any other interaction with the systems. So the OMCD is effectively actually just an application that runs on any mobile phone. So from that point of view, the device itself can have uh, other connections, which we haven't yet I suppose got to the bottom of as to what we want the, other, the device to have. We'll obviously have to have Wi-Fi on to connect to the train, and the PSAs already have their own mobile phones as part of their other duties. So I wouldn't be surprised if we limit just to Wi-Fi and a single app. But technically, yes, because it will just be any other mobile phone. It would ex I would expect it to work. Whether we put a SIM card in it. I don't know. I'd say that would limit its functionality as well. It's an interesting question. At the end of the day, it's software, and there is a limp. You can obviously adjust it to be whatever at the moment it's designed around management of the CIS and the TCMS. I suspect we would struggle to make it any more safety critical than we would then I, I don't think we'd be able to make it safety critical to make decisions or have control from it. At the moment it purely is for information in terms of the control or information train. Doesn't mean it can't happen in the future, but it might have to be a different pro protocol to actually enable it or different device. All right, I'm going to wrap up with one more question. <laughs> Give Andrew, uh, either Barry or Graham. <laughs> okay, Graham. Uh, uh, no, no, in a word. So the, the Wi-Fi on the train is purely uh, for staff only. It's not public. Uh, the Wi-Fi actually isn't connected to the internet directly through the firewall. So, so no. Um, the, the app itself has to have a specific login and a direct login with the train it's on to actually connect in the first place. So, so no. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Andrew. That's been a, um, a really interesting presentation. And um, yeah, it, it's clear that uh, you are um, uh, clearly the expert on this on these new trains. Um, and echo uh, um, some of the comments that came in on on, um, on the chat. We can't wait to uh, be able to um, use these as passengers. Um, and we wish you um, all the success in the rest of the um, the project. Um, so if we could just uh, thank Andrew one more time. Um, Thanks very much. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, it's great um, uh, to see uh, we've had a, a really good turnout today. Thanks very much for your participation in, in, in the Q&A. Um, Hopefully we'll see you um, on the 17th of April um, to hear about the Central Line um, Improvement Programme. Um, have a great evening and uh, see you at the next one. <laughs>